Hello Internet! In the video Why Do We Have Music, I paraphrased Alan Merriam, who states that to science about music is the job of the ethnomusicologist. Well, let's science about music then. Ethnomusicology Explained here to answer five questions about sound. Number one. What is a sonic boom? A sonic boom occurs when pressure waves are pushed by an object travelling at the speed of sound. It is also the sound associated with the shock wave created by an object that is travelling faster than the sound barrier. When an object moves through the air, it creates a series of pressure waves both in front of it and behind it, similar to the bow and stern of a boat. These waves travel at the speed of sound, but as the speed of the object approaches the sound barrier, the waves are compressed as they cannot travel faster than the speed of sound. Eventually, they merge into a single shockwave, travelling at the critical speed known as Mach 1, approximately 1,225 km per hour, or 761 miles per hour. In smooth flight, the shockwave starts at the nose of the aircraft and ends at the tail. Because the different radial directions around the aircraft's direction of travel are equivalent, the shockwave forms a cone with the aircraft at its tip. Once this area of increased pressure reaches the ground, it refracts and forms a cone carpet. When passing a listener, there is a spike in the pressure at the tip of the cone, which then decreases into negative pressure at the tail, followed by a sudden return to normal pressure after the object passes. The boom is experienced when there is a sudden change in pressure, thus the cone actually causes two booms. One when the initial pressure rise from the nose hits, and another when the tail passes and the pressure suddenly returns to normal. If nearby the object, these sonic booms will sound almost instantaneous, and thus will be perceived as only one boom. But in the best case scenario, this will lead to total loss of hearing, and in all likelihood though, death. At up to 200 decibels, a sonic boom is one of the loudest sounds we know of. To put this in perspective, a small 115 kg nuclear bomb registers at around 207 decibels. It is however possible to experience a sonic boom at a safe distance. According to NASA, the width of the boom carpet beneath the aircraft is about one mile for each 1,000 feet of altitude. An aircraft, for example, flying supersonic at 50,000 feet, can produce a sonic boom cone of about 50 miles wide. The sonic boom, however, will not be uniform. Maximum intensity is directly beneath the aircraft, and decreases as the lateral distance from the flight path increases, until it ceases to exist because the shock waves refract away from the ground. Thus, a sonic boom is usually relatively safe, since they are usually created by aircrafts at high altitudes, unless you're directly beneath it. Due to the amount of air displaced, larger objects create louder sonic booms. If you want to learn more, the NASA link is in the description, and I also recommend reading Steve Goodman's Sonic Warfare, Sound, Effect and the Ecology of Fear. Number 2. What is thunder? The sound of thunder is produced by rapidly heated air surrounding lightning, which expands faster than the speed of sound. The effect is similar to one of a sonic boom. The light from the lightning reaches your eyes faster than the sound from the thunder due to their differing speeds. That is 1,230 km per hour for sound and 299,705 km per second for light. That would be 10 to the power of 9 km per hour. That's 10 with 8 zeros after it. But both are created at the same time by the same phenomenon. The electrostatic charge of terrestrial lightning superheats the air to plasma temperatures, up to 100 million degrees Kelvin, along the length of the discharge channel in a short duration. Kinetic theory dictates gaseous molecules undergo a rapid increase in pressure and thus expand outward from the lightning creating a shockwave audible as thunder. Number 3. Is it true that sound can create light? Yes it can. The phenomenon is known as sonoluminescence. It is the emission of short bursts of light from imploding bubbles in a liquid, for example water, when excited by sound. When exposed to waves of low enough pressure, the water molecules cavitate. That is, they will be pulled apart by the negative pressure and create water vapour. Once this bubble of water vapour collapses, a flash of light may occur. The energy released by this flash can create temperatures of up to 2000 Kelvin. That's roughly 1,276 degrees Celsius, or 3,140 degrees Fahrenheit. It is theorized that noble gases within the vapor are superheated by compression as the bubble collapses. But the cool thing is, nobody knows exactly what causes this phenomenon. 
Perhaps some of the best examples of this can be seen in the Pistol Shrimp and Mantis Shrimp, both of which can snap their claws and create cavitation bubbles that they use to stun their prey. A byproduct of this is sonoluminescence. Number 4. How do stringed instruments work? In order to create sound, stringed instruments such as violins, cellos and guitars have a series of stretched strings which vibrate when they are plucked or stroked. The frequency of this vibration is determined by the length of the string. The shorter the string, the more rapid the oscillation, the higher the frequency and thus the pitch. But it is important to note that pitch and frequency are not the same thing. Frequency is a scientifically objective measurement of sound vibrations, while pitch is subjective and decided in relation to other pitches. Sound waves themselves don't have pitch. These vibrations can be easily demonstrated by dipping your hand in a glass of water and running it along the top of a crystal glass. Which leads me to... Number 5. Why do drinking glasses sing? Ever wondered why when you run a wet hand over the rim of a wine glass it creates pitch? Me too. If you were to do this with your hands dry, nothing would happen, as can be seen here. This is because there is too much friction, but apply some water as lubricant to remove some of that friction and we get a stop-start effect over the rim of the glass which causes it to vibrate. It's the same phenomenon that causes that horrible sound of nails on chalkboard. When a glass makes sound, it's because it's vibrating, much like a bell, with the rim and the sides moving in and out very quickly. Several hundred times per second, actually. You can even see the water in the glass vibrate. These vibrations are called its frequency, and are measured in oscillation cycles per second. Vibrating objects like bells and glasses have their own natural frequencies at which they vibrate. If you strike a glass or bell, they will vibrate at the frequency to create a pitch. As we know from question number 4, rapid oscillation creates a higher pitch while slower oscillation creates a low pitch. According to Philip Krasicki of the Cornell Center for Materials Research, the slipstick vibration of your moving finger can get the glass's vibration going by pushing the vibration along the rim. But your finger doesn't stay in one place, so the vibration pattern has to follow your finger around the rim. A neat way to see this vibration pattern is to fill a glass almost full with water and then rub your finger around the rim. Now when the glass sings its note, you can see the ripples in the water near the sides of the glass. For a thorough and more scientific explanation of how this works, I recommend reading Philip's full explanation, a link to which can be found in the description. And there you have it, some science behind music. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to post in the comment section below. And if you want to keep learning about ethnomusicology, musicology, or are just interested in what people think is going on with music, then don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you soon.